Right, good evening and um, good morning for um, people. Welcome back to Global Cup at Home Education Online Classroom. And today we have, um, uh, we are very honored to have uh, our guest speaker from MIT itself for, for the yes. interaction later. Right, um, Sebastian, sometime and I'm very happy and I'm, I'm actually looking forward because like, this is a topic that I never asked. So yeah, I, I, I would like to uh, very look forward for the content today. And also welcome all of you to attend. Uh, okay, let me do some quick uh, introduction to RoboCup at Home Education uh, Online Classroom Series. Um, today we have uh, invited uh, lecture series. Uh, so later on I will explain uh, I that um, today we have him to actually speak a very uh, interesting topic, I, I would say. And, and also it is, so today I'm your host, I'm Jeffrey, as usual. So I will be the host and also later on. Uh, first let me explain about uh, the logistics for, for this, uh, on this time so that we can also uh, allow people from New York zone and also people in Europe, which is same time zone in Italy or France, uh, to join this. So um, you can get more information about our this uh, activities or this um, uh, 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 classes, uh, all the details from our website. So I put a link there so you can refer for more information. For example, okay, the materials today. So uh, this is the page. So you can find the PDF is over here. And they are recording this session. So we will actually put up to our YouTube channel. It refer back to the videos and also the materials uh, and all these things after and also for the community. Yeah. And also we have um, the open source code, which is uh, Sebastian Rex, who like to uh, come in, uh, maybe not now, but later on. We will be about two hours time for this session. So uh, you can come in. Uh, you will get the link to access to this um, Zoom uh, meeting. Uh, from the link. So after you register, you access uh, to this channel. Okay, right. Okay. So um, video will be recorded. So the whole uh, event will be recorded, and then including like Q and A. So later on, if you have um, question uh, in the chat window, so that we can feedback to you. So try to be very careful not to tell unless um, unless you are told to do so. Okay, right. Right, so before I start, so just uh, in case that there are actually people that um, some background introduction about very quickly, just allow me about five minutes, I will do all these things. Right, so RoboCup at Home Education. So um, we home or RoboCup, if you want to know uh, what is RoboCup, you can search on the Google and you can get uh, to know what is RoboCup. So we are an edX to boost um, our participation and also artificial intelligence focused service robot development initiative. Currently, we have four efforts that's in um, active operation. So the first thing is we organize um, edited our online challenge for two or two. So, um, but for normal time, we actually run physical robotics competing tasks, and that is uh, in our education challenge. So we organize um, this kind of uh, challenges or competition in the national levels. Okay, so that is uh, our our main um, activities. And the second one is uh, we um, in many of our talks, we actually try to promote the development of a service robot. So we try to gather all these resources, we made more people, uh, new people or new team, or even people outside of RoboCup uh, who are interested in AI resources for educational purposes. So these are uh, all the activities under this educational initiative. This open courseware. So uh, starting from the beginning, we actually organized hands-on workshops. And now slowly, we actually have a lot of resources that we try to develop teaching materials. So uh, we start with website, so you can head to our website to find more resources on learning how to build robots and also the teaching these materials to teach your community. And you can use it for your school and other. So we try to do a lot of these um, workshops and which is we try to promote uh, this learning of AI and service robot development. So activities in your uh, community, please contact us and so that we can arrange to see how we can actually do to actually outreach all these activities in your uh, place. All right. So um, you can get all those information from website and also and under the page, we actually have a Facebook group where you can interact with us. You can send posts, you can write what, right? And okay, I need to put this thing down. And also thanks to all the sponsors. So we have RoboCup, Messwork, SoftBank, to be a of support throughout the year. Okay. All right. And also for this uh, online classroom, or, or this one did like three classes before, and then we are continue to do this after this. So please um, stay uh, interested. Uh, we welcome you to join for our next session as well. Right. And also we have regular online class and also today's um, uh, presentation. I will show you like next week, we're actually starting one online tutorial series, which is your relation after this. So if you would like to learn more, please um, look at our website for more information and also contact us. 
introduce our speaker. So today, um, thanks a lot for Sebastian, software engineer at MIT Computer Science, working on some home service robotics research with the Toyota Humin, the primary technical contact for RoboCup, and holds a, a bachelor and so master in mechanical engineering from Cornell University with a football robotics application. So I'll leave more um, introduction to Sebastian to do after this, uh, and then I will switch uh, the slides. Great. Okay. Um, let me also turn off my camera. Okay, here. so I pass to you, then you can start your presentation. Yep. All right. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I think um, I'm as surprised as you were uh, that I'm picking this topic, especially given the the background that you've just shared about me. Um, I'm going to talk about natural language processing at a very high level. So it's um it's a big field. There is a lot going on, and we have um, we have quite a bit of topics. So I'm going to go through it um, kind of at the surface, and I'm going to start with some very basic topics and move on to kind of what is the state of the art today. So there's going to be a lot of material. I, I have some examples. I think I will probably be going a little bit quickly um, just because of how much material there is, and I'm hoping that if there are any questions during some of the breaks, uh, we can address some of those. Uh, and of course, as uh, Professor Tan said, the uh, presentation will be recorded and the code will be available too. So that's kind of why I want to make sure I've covered the material and, uh, and then you have things to kind of go back and, and refer to. So before I get into the details of the presentation, I want to uh, start with a little scenario here. So let's say that you have a robot and you wanted to do something. Um, you don't yet know what this is, but maybe you want to ask the robot to get you an apple from some kind of shelf in the kitchen. One way that you could do this is to have you know, some kind of code API to your robot where you know exactly maybe where you have to drive to go to the kitchen, where you have to go to pick up the apple. So you have all these positions or poses in, in, in the physical space and you can tell your robot maybe to navigate somewhere to set the end effector or the hand of the robot to a particular position, close the gripper, come back, and so on. So you have this kind of you know very programmery interface here where you're typing something in front of a laptop, putting it on the robot, and seeing what happens. And maybe you get back some kind of acknowledgement from your robot. So the robot will then go over to the kitchen and it'll find the shelf containing you know some fruits like an apple and a banana, and then you get this horrible log message that will tell you things like status equals zero, target active, and then log error, and something happens, the robot stops moving. How do you know why the robot stopped moving or what, uh, what went wrong? So there might be some hints here. Maybe at the very end of this, of this terrible line, you see that there's uh, log error, maybe means that there was an error message, um, and this tag here maybe says that something ex exceeded its max tries. So anyway, the whole point is that this is really hard to understand. Take the alternative. So let's try again. Now the human is not sitting in front of a computer, but just sitting down enjoying their drink. And they can speak to the robot in human language. So you can say, hey robot, could you please fetch me an apple from the high shelf in the kitchen? And the robot will respond to you also in the language that you know, and it will confirm to you that it's going to the right place and it's going to find an apple in the upper shelf. So it goes over there and it still stops working. So there's still an error, but now it's actually explaining to you uh, why this error came up. So you can actually you know, figure this out. And in fact, it's even providing an alternate plan for you. So it's saying that the apple is actually too high for you to reach or for the robot to reach. So as two possible solutions, you can either come get the apple yourself, assuming you're taller than the robot, or it can bring you an object that it knows it can reach, like a banana. So this is, you know, these are two very extreme examples, but they motivate why natural language processing can be useful. So especially as, as you're trying to deploy a robot that's not too, um, that, that to people that are not programmers, you, uh, you get a lot of benefits from using natural language to do this kind of interaction. So it's easier for you as a human to you know, provide input or commands or whatever to the robot. The robot actually tells you feedback about whether it got the correct uh, command. And most importantly, 
you get an explanation for why things did or didn't work. So I want to formalize it a little bit now. Um, natural language processing or NLP is a branch of artificial intelligence that deals with this communication between humans and machines, and most importantly, doing so in the natural language of a human that is, um, you know, text, speech, and so on. In, in, and, you know, the ideal NLP would be, or the ideal system would be one where we don't have to change how we talk to the robot versus how we talk to a human. Um, there are a couple of kind of sub branches of NLP and the, the most common ones we'll see here uh, will, uh, are what you see here. So you have a person speaking to some kind of system uh, and that's that speech, that raw audio signal needs to be converted to text, or it can be, and this is normally known as speech recognition or automatic speech recognition. Then to extract information from that text or from that audio, it, it's kind of the, the biggest branch, in, in my opinion, which is natural language understanding. So once you have this text, how do you actually get something out of it? So if I told the robot to go to the kitchen, does it know what a kitchen is? Does it know what go is? So that's kind of where you would do the understanding portion. And then you have the, the way for the, for the robot or the system to get information back to the human. And that's gonna be uh, things like natural language generation. So can it speak back or can it type back to you? Um, also known as text-to-speech, for example. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus mostly on natural language understanding. I think some of the other uh, RoboCup at Home online classes and resources have talked a little bit about speech recognition and, and uh, text-to-speech. So I want to focus more on that, that very meaty part in the middle. Now, NLP is a lot of applications and you know, certainly out, uh, beyond robotics. Uh, kind of going down from the simplest to maybe some of the most complicated and relevant, um, one thing that you can absolutely do with, with text or speech is our classification tasks. So this is basically bucketing your, your let's call it just text, your text into different categories. Um, for example, sentiment analysis would tell you whether a sentence is positive or negative or neutral. You might have other things like topic detection. So are you talking about sports or are you talking about cars? Um, part of speech tagging. So what is a noun? What is a verb? So these are all like classification tasks and that have a lot of applications. Um, you can also generate text from other text or from other types of inputs. So for example, a, a, a common common types of text to text generation would be like Google Translate. So you're translating from one language to the other. And uh, there's a lot of NLP techniques for that or, or summarizing a very long text into a short one. You can also of course generate text from speech or from, uh, from images. So like providing an automatic caption for an image. There's also discourse or dialogue. So this is, this is Similar in the sense that the, you are speaking to some kind of robot or system like, uh, you know, like Siri, Alexa, and so on. And based on what you ask, what you command, the robot can interpret what you're doing and either respond accordingly, tell you why it can't respond or, or just provide answers to you or, or do things like play music, like you see in this example. Um, and as we go down, I think that the next one is the one that maybe is the most relevant for robotics, which has to do with grounding. Uh, grounding is a term used basically to associate language with things that are existing in the real world. So like objects or actions that you can perform on the real world. And the reason this is, of course, common for robotics is because unlike some of these other things like Alexa or just, you know, like chatbots in general, robots typically... Um, yeah. Robots typically have, sorry, my Alexa is talking to me now because I said it. <laughs> um, yeah, so typically robots will have uh, some way to interact with the physical world. Uh, for example, in, in this case, you can use the language to say, pick up the farthest red block on the left. And all this language has information like farthest, red, block, left. This is all useful for the robot to do something. Um, and it's not just with language, right? Robots have other sensors, which we'll get to shortly. So there's many more applications, but these are some common ones that I kind of wanted to talk about. Okay. Now, as you talk about natural language processing, there's kind of two, two fields of NLP, um, which kind of broken down into rule-based and statistical NLP. 
So rule base is anything where I guess you you know exactly what you're getting because you're programming the rules yourselves. So this might be things like having knowledge about the grammar of your language or looking for patterns in your text. So so this is kind of the traditional type of programming, right? Where you're, again, you are coding these rules so you know exactly what, what's gonna happen. Whereas the statistical NLP uh, usually involves using large amounts of data and, and either training a model or having a model extract patterns. Um, and uh, by far, this is dominated by machine learning. Uh, the way this works, or the way, the reason that this, this uh, statistical NLP is taking over is because, well, really, ever since the internet, we've amassed some giant, giant bodies of data, um, which you'll often see named corpus or corpora for plural, which just means body in Latin. So the, the idea is that you can use all this data to, to extract information from language, and you don't have to write any of the rules yourself, or you can maybe reduce the number of rules you write yourself by just you know scraping through data, extracting features, and then using a model for things like prediction or text generation, answering questions, and whatnot. So really for the rest of the talk, I will be going through examples and really how the, how the techniques have evolved from rule-based systems to um, the state of the art in machine learning. So I'll, I'll do a couple of quick slides and examples on rule-based NLP, and then uh, I'll maybe break for the first set of questions. So rule-based NLP, it, again, it's, it's pretty easy to implement, and it can do a really good job if you know exactly the type of problem that you want to solve. But the problem is that it doesn't generalize well, because if you make the rules, anytime you get something that you weren't expecting or you haven't seen before, which is super common in, in language, uh, there's a chance that your system will fail. But rule-based NLP still has a lot of great applications for things like uh, text pre-processing. You might be searching for keywords, like you know maybe your robot has like an emergency stop word. So it doesn't matter what else you say. If you say that word, the robot will shut down. Um, and also just kind of how NLP really started is by, um, by actually borrowing from a lot of linguistics. So for example, if you have text, you can actually use the grammar of, of a language like English or Spanish and, and break down the structure of the text using actual rules, um, which can help later on. So I think, you know, the, the tweet that I put on here in the screenshot is, is a little silly, but uh, I think rule-based NLP is basically just a bunch of if statements that you add to your code base that can really help. And, and we shouldn't dismiss the, the use of them, right? Like I said, it's very easy to implement a rule-based system and you know exactly what you're gonna get. But typically you, you have a combination of rule-based and machine learning approaches kind of working together. So to, to add a bit more detail before we go to the examples, this is kind of a typical uh, rule-based NLP pipeline. Uh, the way it would work is that you would, again, start with some raw text. So maybe you have like an entire paragraph of text that you can break down into its individual components. So maybe multiple sentences can be broken down into individual sentences. And each individual sentence can then be broken down into a list of words. So this is typically uh, what you call seg sentence segmentation or tokenization. And once you have these individual words, um, you can start moving towards some of these linguistic approaches. Like, for example, you can tag the parts of speech of a sentence so for instance, this, this beginning of the sentence here, the little yellow dog, you know that little and yellow are adjectives and dog is a noun. And this can help later on because once you have these tagged parts of speech, you can, for example, convert these things into individual phrases in a sentence. Um, and we'll go through this in an example, but the idea is that you can really break down the sentence into phrases so you can extract information like what is the subject? What is the object? Um, how are things related to each other? You know, if I say, uh, pick up an apple and take it to the kitchen, what does it mean? Well, maybe it refers to the apple. So you can, you can use the structure of the sentence to figure out these, um, these relationships. So again, the, the idea of rule-based NLP is to take things that you already know about language or what you expect that the human is going to say to your robot and make some kind of connection to that. So yeah, I'm going to go through just a couple examples to help that sink in. 
And uh, I will be using Python for all of this, though it, it is probably the most standard language for natural language processing now, but by far not the only one. So let's go to these rule-based examples. And we'll get started. So what I'm first going to show is just very, very basic processing of uh, text data using Python. The, the, the examples that I'm going to take are really going to have to do around input sentences like the one I've highlighted here, which might say something like, go to the kitchen and then get me an apple. Let's suppose that we are dealing with home robotics, so this could be a very common uh, sentence. And what I want to do with this example is extract out um, both the location that the person is telling me and the object that the person wants me to go get. Again, the, the rules are already making assumptions about the system that I'm always going to have sentences that look like this, which is completely not true, but it's a start. Um, especially if you need to put together a demo you know, by tomorrow. So the way it works, you know, sentences have, you can have uppercase and lowercase, punctuation, and so on. So typically you want to process these sentences. Um, the way you can do this in, in, in Python, for instance, is if I take a sentence like this that has punctuation and uppercases, I can ex first extract the lower of the sentence. So that way I don't have to when I'm doing the rest of my search, I don't have to care about the case, just convert all to lowercase, I don't care. Um, I'm going to remove the punctuation. And most importantly, once I have that process sentence, I'm going to break it down by, by splitting the sentence or splitting the, the string by its spaces so that, in, so that I end up getting basically a list of words. So you see that when I run this particular block of code, then the original sentence, go to the kitchen, comma, and then get me an apple, full stop, now just becomes a list of you know, individual words, and they're all lowercase. Um, why is that useful? Well, if we're looking, for example, for the name of objects, now it's super easy for us to search through this list and just look for the word apple, whereas before we might have had to do some more complicated things. Um, so, and, and that kind of gets to one of the most basic forms of rule-based NLP, which is just keyword extraction, right? If I'm looking for the, for the word Apple, I can just grab it from this list um, by just looping through that list, right? So you can create a, you know, a very simple function like that where let's suppose you have this input sentence. Again, this is the same sentence. And then maybe you have a repository of known objects and locations that you're looking for. So the person could ask for apple, water, or snacks. And it could request that you go to the kitchen, bedroom, or garage. So these are just examples, right? You could, of course, put in your own knowledge base, which is a very common thing for rule-based systems. The idea would be that you would, look, you would go through this sentence, you would pre-process it, and then you would look for all of these objects with, just by looping through the sentence. So like for object and objects, you know, check if any of those are in your list of words. And if so, that's your target object. Um, so sure, this works. Again, it, you can already see that it's going to be very limiting, but, but it can work. Um, so for instance, the idea would be that if we go through one of these sentences, then it would correctly be able to pick up that my target object is Apple because the word Apple is in my list of words. And similarly, the target location is kitchen because that's also in, in my list of words. Um, like with any software, you probably want to test it on multiple sentences. So let's say we have a couple more, right? Um, I've now created this list of sentences here. So go to the kitchen, get me an apple, bring me a bottle of water, so on. And I'm just going to try these same two functions that we've written and, and seeing what you get when you run this, right? So you see that the first one is the same one as before. So we correctly identified that maybe the user wants an apple from the kitchen. Um, the next one is uh, bring me a bottle of water where you identify the correct object water, but there's no location, which seems right. Um, the next one is kind of the opposite, right? Where you're telling the robot to go to a location, the garage, but there's no object. So again, you can extract all this information. And then once you have these, 
you can have the robot actually do the action. So for example, if you know the location of the garage, maybe the next step is to kind of read that in and tell your robot to navigate there. But the, the last example there didn't quite work. So I asked the robot to find a snack in my bedroom, but the target object here shows up as none. And the, the reason for that is if you look at the, the list of objects at the very top of the screen, right? Then I have snacks, plural, as, as my object, but I told the robot snack, singular. So this is you know a very common thing of rule-based systems where if you're not careful about all the different ways that a user could say a word, you know, whether they use the singular or plural or they misspell it or they use a different word, like if I say chips instead of snacks, then this system will already start failing. So not great. Um, although there are ways to use patterns to make this useful, um, which is kind of what gets to the last bit here, which is another way to process text is by using uh, what are known as regular expressions. And these are pretty hard to pick up, but I absolutely want to bring them up because they're used so much in rule-based systems and pre-processing that if you're doing any kind of text pre-processing, you should invest in learning regular expressions. But you know, there is a Python package called RE for regular expression that, that lets you define these patterns. And I haven't done anything too complicated here, um, but I want to show you just at the very least that how we can deal with um, some of the things that we've already done using regular expressions. Let me scroll down actually first, and I want to show you these input sentences that I have here. Notice that I've already made them a little, a little more funky than before, right? Uh, for example, here, the bottle of water, I've, you know, missed, I've had a typo, so I missed the space between of and water. I added exclamation marks. I'm using snack singular. You know, instead of kitchen, I'm saying kitchenette. And most importantly, um, I'm actually now using the living room as one of the rooms, which is something that our previous system couldn't handle because we were splitting the words by spaces. So you would have to do a little more complicated logic to look for the word living and the word room immediately after. Regular expressions, on the other hand, they don't require you to split up the string. You can actually just pass in the sentence directly and just look for these patterns. And that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, if I look at the, the way that I've written this function, for example, if I'm looking for the object, I'm going to look for the patterns. I'm going to look for the name of the object plus, and this is the, where the regular expression magic comes in, plus the letter S and there's an asterisk. So what I'm saying is I'm looking for the name of the object and then either zero or more S's that come in after. So for example, if I if snack is one of my objects, then I can tell the, the system um, that both snack and snacks, plural, are valid. Plus, I can now search for this pattern using this ignore case, meaning that it doesn't matter whether the, the string is uppercase or lowercase, it will just return them both. Um, and there's a lot of patterns that you can extract uh, using regular expressions like, like looking for words that are in between other words or, or certain patterns of punctuation. So you can really do a lot there and a lot of pre-processing you're going to see out in the wild will use regular expressions. So as you can see, I'm just kind of scrolling down to the output of this, but I mean, these are some handpicked examples, but it's able to, to now, uh, the system is now able to, to go through a more robust set of input cases. Like we said, when we say of water here, it didn't matter that that was not able to split into two words because you're just looking for the pattern water in any uppercase or lowercase in your sentence. So that's one uh, rule-based system. The other one I want to show is, is the one that deals with language uh, or linguistics a little bit more. And for this one, we're actually going to use one of the most popular tools to get started with NLP, which is called NLTK, or Natural Language Toolkit. Uh, the, the way this is going to work is we're going to perform, we're going to tag a sentence with its parts of speech, and then we're going to create a grammar and parse it. So how that's going to work is 
I'm just going to import NLTK and I'm going to actually download a model here. So already we're, we're kind of violating a rule-based system where uh, the part of speech tagging is actually trained on some data. So it is a statistical or a machine learning based model. But besides that, the rest of it is going to be rule-based. So we'll just see what this does. But the idea is we're going to import an LTK and then we're going to download a pre-trained model that lets us uh, tag the sentence with this part of speech. So I'm just going to download that and then I'll show you what this means. So instead of having to process this, the, the strings, you know, just by writing Python code from scratch, we can now take an input sentence that looks very similar to the one before and then use functions that are built in in NLTK to do everything that, we've, that we did previously. So for example, you've got the word tokenize function, which just splits your sentence into multiple words. And then you have this uh, POS tag or part of speech tag, which is gonna use the model that we just downloaded and return to you the part of speech. And that's what you see here. So now your sentence is broken down into these, uh, these tuples where, for example, it, it's really saying things like, go is a verb, kitchen is a noun, uh, big is an adjective, and so on. Um, and, and these actually, these um, parts of speech are just standard. Uh, so there actually is a guide that I've linked to here, which tells you what all these parts of speech are there. Um, so, so why do we care about doing this? Well, the idea is that, like I said, once we, once we have more information about the sentence, like this is a verb, this is a noun, and so on, it, it lets us do some really cool things. Um, and, and I will show you that in just a second. Suppose, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit more. Suppose now, now once we have a tag sentence, let's say that we're gonna impose two rules on the system. One is that there's something called a noun phrase. So this is something that describes something, like for example, a big red apple. And in contrast, you have something called a verb phrase. So this is a combination of a verb some things in between and a noun phrase. It's kind of hard to, to explain this in just text, so I think it's best to go through an example. So what I've created here, um, if, if we take that same sentence, go to the kitchen and find a big red apple, by creating a grammar, you can actually split this sentence up into a tree. So for example, this has been broken down into two verb phrases, right? So, so the, the first phrase is go to the kitchen. And the second phrase is find a big red apple because these are two completely separate commands that are split up by, by the word and. So the idea is that we can parse a sentence with rules and then for each of them, we now have simpler sentences that we can go through ourselves. Um, and then similarly, the noun phrase, for example, will be things like the kitchen or a big red apple. So you can kind of use this verb phrase versus noun phrase to, to split up, you know, what is the action that you're requesting of the robot versus what is the object that, or the, that you want to go get. So the way this works is that you can define, it looks very similar to regular expressions, but you can define the rules that make up a noun phrase. This is saying there might be any number of, of uh, determinants like the, uh, you know, things like that, any number of adjectives and any number of nouns. And, and these rules are, are how you then NLTK can parse these sentences and, and, and get you this tree. So the idea now, I'm, I'm gonna just keep scrolling through. The idea is that once you have a tree like this, you can extract information directly from the sentence. So for example, if I, if I go back to that same you know, example, go over to the kitchen and find a bigger apple, by splitting this into two verb phrases, each of which has its own noun phrase, you can extract things like, hey, the first sentence ha has an action of go and the target of kitchen. And the second sentence is saying find apple. Um, and you can try this with other types of sentences like you see here, like open the refrigerator and grab a water bottle or proceed to the garage and empty out the trash. So these things can help you again, just break down your sentence into something simpler and, and come up with some cool, um, some some patterns, I guess, that you can that you can use to enforce your rules. So I don't want to talk too much more about that. But the whole point is that with 
by defining it, by, by tagging your sentence with the parts of speech. Maybe I'll, I'll go back to the slides for this. So by tagging your sentence with these parts of speech, you can then create a grammar that you can use to break these sentences into a tree. And then you can actually just with regular programming, you can go through that tree and come, come out with information about your sentence. So that's, that's all I want to say about rule-based NLP. I want to stop for a couple of minutes for questions so far, if there are any, maybe Jeffrey, if there's any in the chat. Yes, some, um, uh, okay, so actually just now there's a question about, okay, the automated knowledge graph generation comes under rule-based NLP or statistical rule-based, uh, statistical-based NLP. That's one of the questions. You mean, I'm not sure yeah. if you, uh, you know about automated knowledge, knowledge graph. By... So um, the mean, question you mean, is like... You mean this tree right here or the technique automated yeah. knowledge graphs? Yeah, so the, the question is like this automated knowledge graph generation is yeah. under rule based or under statistical based some um, NLP. Yeah, well, the th so here's the thing. Um, it can actually it can actually work for both, right? So if you come up with a, this tree structure like this using an actual grammar of rules, then that's a rule based NLP, right? Where you have these rules like, hey, you have a verb, a verb, a bunch of adjectives, and a noun means this. That's fine. However, there are um, statistical approaches to generate these knowledge graphs uh, by using learned methods. Um, take for example. Uh, you know, we'll see this later, but take neural networks, for instance. You can actually take a bunch of data instead of rules, just get a bunch of sentences that some human already labeled by themselves, and then use that as training data to train a model. And that, it, that absolutely works too. Um, there, is, um, there is a library by Stanford called Stanza in which they do the part of speech tagging completely with neural networks. So you can do both. It just depends on whether you do it with rules or by reading a bunch of text that someone has tagged. Right, so that I, I guess that answered the question. So the next question that we got in the chat is, um, so you are using the Jupyter notebook, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So maybe you want to introduce a bit, so someone want to know more, like whether you can do this in Google Collab, et cetera. Oh, yeah. So maybe you want to introduce a bit about the environment you are using or you are showing just now. Sure. Yeah, so, so this is a Jupyter Notebook. It's, um, it's, I guess it's an alternate file type for Python uh, files where you can basically open up a Python file in a browser and mark it down with you know, this kind of uh, like nicely formatted text. So it, it, it's a way just to make it easier to go through concepts, especially when you're trying to like explain concepts to people. Hopefully this looks a little bit nicer than just giving you, you know, like a like a completely raw text file, like a Python file. Um, like like uh, you just said, Jeffrey, that there are other types of notebooks that you can use with languages like Python or, or R, like uh, Jupyter, this, this is Jupyter Notebooks, you have Google Colab Notebooks and so on. And the, the great thing about these notebooks, besides that I can show them to you now, is that if you go to the GitHub repository where I've uploaded this code, you can actually look at this code with the outputs and the plots without even downloading it. So it'll render on GitHub. So it, it's good just if you want to like scroll through code and, and learn about what's happening rather than performance. Okay, so you want more question? Okay. Right, so we have the next question. So can rule-based NLP to be used to classify synonyms of, um, of action like take, grabs, yeah. or take, bring all, refer to object manipulation? Yes, you can, but you have to create the rule yourself. So actually, let, this is something that I've done in some of my work. One way that you can do this, um, if I just go back to where I'm doing the rules, right? Suppose I have this list of objects like apple, water, snacks. You can actually create dictionaries. So like I can say synonyms, um, and then I can create a dictionary where maybe snacks has a bunch of synonyms that I will accept as valid, like chips, uh, Cheetos, um, 
you know, candy and so on. So, so you can use our, I think this is probably one of the best ways to encode synonyms is by creating dictionaries where what this is saying is that the synonym of snacks can be any of these words in this list. And now you're also going to be searching not only through the list of objects, but through all its synonyms. Of course, this can get really, 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 really um, hard to code up by hand. And we're going to see how we can leverage some machine learning techniques so that we don't have to do this. And, and the model just learns about words that are related to each other. All right. Okay. So, so maybe one question from me, <laughs> Sebastian. Yeah, sure. So actually I use, uh, I think like for the previous um, development that I have in my teams, we, we, we use all, a lot on this rule-based things and we try to create the objects because like, especially in RoboCup at home competition, so we have finite numbers of objects, finite numbers of locations and everything is um, under control. So we, we know all these things. It's just that, and, and most of the time, uh, even the sentence generator, which is used by the jury or, or the, the referee, uh, yeah. we, we, we can predict, I mean, we know the database that they use and so on. So in this kind of scenario, uh, we use a lot of this rule base because it's more reliable and, and yeah. speed is, uh, is, is one of the big factor in, instead of like, if you want to do like the learning and so on, you, you can't make it during the competition. So we use a lot of this, but actually I would like to add actually one more features for this rule base to make it more powerful. <laughs> I mean, powerful means, can we actually make the robot actually learn new rules or learn new vocab or for example, like new entries of the database? For example, like um, we, can, we can say that, okay, you can say this in this name or the other one can say this in another name. And then you can tell the robot that add, add this into the database and you can use the same rules. So with the same mechanism, with the learning, actually it's more practical then you actually try to introduce a very complex thing to actually replace the whole thing. So that is actually another approach that currently we are, I'm trying to see yeah. if this will actually help. Okay, so maybe you can like give me some comment about this. No, I think that's very good um, because, so what you're actually describing, like you said, it's absolutely a rule-based system because you're creating a rule. M maybe the rule is something like, I have my initial set of rules that I made by hand, but if, yeah, but if a human says something that the robot doesn't know, instead of giving up and failing, it will say, Hey, I don't know what that means. Can you explain it to me in the, in the terms that I know? Yes. And, and once you do that, then you basically just add a bunch more rules automatically to the system. That is Correct. still AI because you're using these rules to automatically grow your database by the robot experiencing things. So I think that's yes. very useful. Um, of course, the, you just have to make sure that then your robot does keep this growing database of things. And maybe if this robot's been out in the field for five years, then at some point it might need, might run out of memory. You know, it might need to start forgetting rules or combining them. So, so the thing about like, you know, these database rule systems that you have to be careful that they don't run away on you as people keep adding more and more information. I think human brains are really good at compressing that, but maybe a rule-based system like that no not so much mm -hmm. yeah yeah so I, I guess like this is one of uh how to say some a little bit extension from what we are doing in rule base that yeah. we can actually extend a lot because that is actually how human works as well i mean like we yeah. do things as, as as time go on we learn but we might take a long time in order to know a lot of things because we yeah. need a lot of experience but that is how we learn so for, for robots or for machines, it's different. Like we can actually use a very complex thing. So maybe later on you can, you can do some comparison when you show the statistical way, um, use machine learning way. And with yeah. this rule base, how complex it's become and then the cost is it actually um, worth for us to actually put in this cost depends on the complexity of the task that we want to solve. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you, you can do you can do this comparison later on. So we have yep. one more question, which is um, asked about the name of Python IDE that you use. Oh, it uh, is. Uh, sure. Okay, yeah. It's the Jupyter Notebook. So can can no one see it here? Actually, I think it's because I hit the the header. Yes. So here it is, Jupyter Notebook. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. Right. So, so we want to proceed. 
yes, I will okay. go on to the to what I consider to be the fun stuff, which is machine okay. learning. All right. So for statistical NLP, I'm going to break it down to before and after deep learning or neural networks. So, so this one, um, this portion is really just what used to be the state of the art up until, I don't know, let's, let's call it maybe five or a little more years ago. But just in general, what is statistical NLP and how is it different from the rule-based systems that we just saw, right? Throw a bunch of data at your system. The system might, um, you might do some feature extraction and then you train a model to automatically extract some structure or some patterns from the data. Um, there are some techniques like clustering or topic modeling that are common here, and we'll talk a bit more about those. Um, but more commonly, uh, you have supervised learning. So this is where your data actually is labeled, and you're trying to train a model to predict on new data um, based on what you've seen before. So this has to do with like classifying text or, or generating text or predicting certain properties about your text. So, so really, the, the entire branch of, I guess, what I'll call the traditional statistical NLP has to do with how do you extract features from text? And then once you have the features, what are the models that you can use? And I think that one of the things that is most interesting to me is this extracting features from text, because the problem is you think of your typical like machine learning model, it, you, it accepts numbers or numerical data, but text is not numbers. So, so we have to be a little clever about how we represent these features so that we can use them with a model. And that gets into this really busy set of slides here that I will go through in, in more detail. But I want to talk about four different techniques for extracting features from text. Manual features, bag of words features, n-grams, and unsupervised learning. And I'm going to build these up, so don't worry. Let's start with the manual features. So this is something where maybe you have some knowledge about your problem where you can extract information about your text and, and get numerical features that maybe are related to what you're trying to solve. So let's take the example sentence here, the big apple. Some manual features I, I can think of, for example, are, hey, let's extract the first and last character of every word. Okay, that's, it could work. Um, what about the lengths of the words? So three, five, and five. Maybe there's some model that can learn about how long a word is. And what's nice is that that's a numeric feature. Or the parts of speech. So we maybe already had another model that would tag the parts of speech. And I can have a model that will learn what happens if something is a noun or a verb. But this, these, are, these are sometimes used not so much anymore these days. The most common way to extract manual features is this technique called one-hot encoding, which I'm going to dig more into in just a second. So one-hot encoding, it, it assumes that you have a vocabulary of data, and I'm making this very simple. So suppose, you're, suppose that of all the data that you've ever read for this problem, there are only four different words, the, apple, big, and red. So I'm just going to give them all a number, 0, 1, 2, 3. And what one hot encoding will do is that for each word in your sentence, it's going to create a vector where the word that it's referring to is going to have one and every other thing is going to have zero. That's why it's called one hot encoding, that every column only has one hot word. So for example, the sentence, the big apple will have a, um, a column with index zero, a column with index two for big, and then a column for index one for Apple. So what you can do is build up this like numeric feature from your entire vocabulary. And you, you can do this with characters as well, right? So for example, a one-hot encoding on letters could be a, like a vector of 26 different characters for the English language. So one-hot encoding is a super popular uh, technique to, to extract things from a big vocabulary of words. So basically, if you have a sentence, then you, you put together a matrix where every column corresponds to a different word. But that doesn't tell you a whole lot. Um, in particular, it, it, 
it, it can be very inefficient and uh, there it doesn't really tell you anything more about the word that it's one of the possible words in your vocabulary. And that's where a lot of the other techniques come in. Um, bag of words features another way to build these vectors, but instead of instead of chaining the words together, it actually is counting the occurrences. So for example, let's say that we have a data set which has three sentences. I love dogs. I hate dogs and knitting. Knitting is my hobby and my passion. The bag of words feature will actually just create a vector where it, it gives you the count of words in a sentence. So for example, take that third sentence where there is one count of and knitting is my is hobby passion and then two counts of my. And by actually having this count, you actually get more information than just is that word in a sentence, but you get how many of them there are. Um, they, they've done, or the, the, the literature has done a lot of techniques to, to kind of help with words that are maybe too, like very common or not so common. And these are extra techniques that they call TF-IDF or term frequency inverse document frequency. And, and the way that this works, um, is that these two terms are basically a way of rescaling your vector or your, your um, bag of words features so that words that are, that are more common across the entire data set get a lower weight. Like you see, for example, that the word I and the word and have low weights because they're, they're going to be in probably every document. Um, and then the other term has to do with words that are unique to that sentence get a higher weight. So for example, in document three, then it was the only sentence that had the word my, so it gets a really high score because it's not in any of the other um, sentences. So this can also help you build up these numeric features where instead of just being, you know, like a sparse vector where each, you know, each column just has one, one, and a bunch of zeros, you now have a like a nicer vector to put into, into your models. But, but what we spoke about with the bag of words features or the one hot encoding is that you're counting every word individually, right? So every time you see a new word, you have to add a new column or, or a new, uh, yeah, new row to your vector. And it doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you about um, the, the relationship between words. So this type of feature will tell you that the word dog is in the sentence, but it doesn't tell you where in the sentence it is. And that definitely matters. So that's where people came up with this technique called n-grams. So instead of, instead of basically breaking down your language or your features into like every new word is a new feature, you can actually use combinations of words, but, and, or they call things like bigrams or trigrams, foregrams, and so on. Where now, for example, this three grams, instead of just being individual words that you're looking for, you're looking for sequences of three words like the quick brown or quick brown fox. And, and this helps to encode some of the context or, or basically the neighboring words um, which have more power for prediction. And we'll, we'll see some examples of this as well. But the idea is, that, is basically that you can you can parse through a vocabulary of words, or you can parse through a vocabulary of word sequences or grams. Um, the, the last set of features is just using unsupervised learning. So this is training a model to automatically get features uh, for you, which you can then maybe use for other models. I won't talk too much about unsupervised learning in this talk, but you know, for example, um, the, the link that I've shared here is one where it goes through a bunch of documents uh, it automatically generates these clusters and you can see that the clusters tend to be grouped by different topics because you, you're going to cluster by words that are appear close to each other very commonly. So for example, the yellow cluster here, it seems to have a lot of uh, topics about religion, whereas topic number three, the red one, has a lot of information about sports. And what this is saying is that typically you don't have sentences that talk about both sports and religion but there are sentences that talk about those things together a lot. Um, and again, knowing which cluster your data belongs to can then help you with predictions. So there's a lot of features here. We are going to go through examples. Um, I do want to talk more about just keeping this short. So like I said, the 
it's really, really inefficient to just go through a set of text and have basically one dimension for every single separate word that you've ever seen. There are a lot of words in, in any language. So your feature vectors are going to get very big very quickly. Luckily, there, there have been ways that, that uh, people have kept these in check. One of them is very common. It's, no, it's known as stop word removal. And you'll see this in a lot of the, the Python packages. So these are words that, that you can consider that they don't really matter if they're in a sentence, like the, which, that. They don't give you any, any more information in the sentence, so you can just remove them, and that will keep your vocabulary lower. You can also just limit the vocabulary size, so you can basically um, you know, take words that are not so common and just replace them with like a placeholder, which is usually we'll see in the literature as the unknown or unk token. So, you know, words that are just so uncommon that you'll never see, let's just treat them as unknown. It, it'll, it's a trade-off. Um, another big one is to actually use more rule-based systems for um, converting words to their root terms. So take, for example, let's say your vocabulary has the words walking, walks, and walked. Well, they all mean the same thing, they're, but they're different words. So can we just use the word walk any, any time we see these? Um, and there are common techniques that you'll, again, find in, in a lot of packages, pre-trained models for uh, stemming, lemmatization, and canonicalization. They all do similar things, but slightly different. But the, the, the central idea is just reducing the total number of words by getting back to just like a root basic term of your words. And finally, that you don't have to use words. Um, you can use subword features to train models. And I wanted to give you the example of English here, that in English, the dictionary has about 170,000 words, which is a lot. So if you, if you don't use any of the techniques above, you're gonna have vectors that are up to that size. Um, on the other hand, there are 26 characters in the English language or 44 phonemes. These are, these are essentially all the sounds that your mouth can make in the English language. So you see, if you, instead of using words, you use phonemes or characters, you get much lower feature dimensions, but it's much more difficult to, um, to keep the language natural because if you make a mistake in like predicting a character, then all of a sudden you could get a completely garbage word. So it's another trade-off um, that you can make there. But all of these can help you reduce the basically the size of the feature vectors from the previous slide. So there's a lot in, in feature selection for, for natural languages you can see here. I just wanted to give you a little sample. Um, but regardless of how, you know, once you've extracted the features, there are lots of models that you can use on those features. And this at this point, you know, once you've got your features, there's nothing separating these types of problems from any other machine learning problem, because now you're just passing numbers or numerical features to a model for prediction. I'm just going to give you some of the common models that are used in NLP. So for unsupervised learning, you've got clustering, then like k-means clustering, for example. Um, you've got this traditional set of techniques called topic modeling, which uh, actually showed in, the, in one of the previous slides how you can group group uh, different types of sentences into their the topics they talk about by just seeing how how words kind of bunch up together and something that i'll talk about later which is word embeddings or other types of embeddings whereas on the supervised learning you see that these are all just models that you might have seen in your machine learning class like decision trees uh linear regression logistic regression support vector machines and most importantly which we'll get to later is neural networks so the idea is that really for, for traditional NLP tasks, you have to basically come up with a good set of features to extract, and then you can throw them at any of your, of your standard uh, statistical models for the tasks that you want to do. A lot of information, so I want to solidify that with a few examples. If I go to the traditional ML folder, I'm gonna start with a simple example where we're extracting manual features from, from text. So again, here I'm gonna use NLTK for, for um, I think it's mostly just to, uh, 
because it has a data set. But the most important thing is that I'm, I'm going to use this library here, sklearn or scikit-learn. Uh, this is basically the standard Python library for any type of uh, machine learning model that is not neural networks, like support vector machines and linear regression. So if you've done machine learning with Python, you'll probably have used sklearn. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to load this data set called the names corpus, which is a pretty simple data set. Um, the way it works is I'm just going to download it from using NLTK, and then I'll show you what this, uh, what this data set has. Um, so this, this is a very simple data set. It, oop, I forgot to import my modules. So this basically has a, a bunch of text files which has names that are traditionally male names and names that are traditionally female names. Um, and you see that the, just kind of scrolling through the data set, there are almost 8,000 total names where about 3,000 are male and 5,000 are female. And here are some samples, right? So you have names like Lissy, which are tagged as female, or Eric, which is tagged as male. So what I want to do is create a machine learning model with this data that will look at some manual features I extract and try to classify whether or not uh, this name is a traditional male or female name. So what we'll do first, you know, we'll, we'll follow the same thing as the slides, right? We'll extract features and then extract, uh, and then train a model. So for the features, I'm actually going to pick something you know very manual. That's the whole point of this exercise. I'm going to pick the first letter, which is just the, basically the zero index of the of the name. And then the last letter, which is the minus one, if I just kind of go backwards, so it's the, the final letter of the name. So for instance, you can see that Lissy has a first letter of L and the last letter of E. But remember, it's not enough. Like maybe this will work, like if I just take the first and last letter and classify this good. But remember, we have to convert this to a numerical feature before we train a model. And that's where we're going to use the one hot encoding. Um, actually, sklearn already has a one-hot encoder, which is really nice. So I'm just going to create this one-hot encoder and on my data. And you'll see that, uh, at least for the features, then now my training vector becomes a 7944 by 52 vector. And that's because every column, or how does it work? Well, anyway, each of these 7944 is one of the data sets, and then 52 is our vector dimension. And that's because our one-hot encoding, remember, it's taking every possible character and creating a new dimension out of it. Because we're using two letters, the first, the first letter and the last letter, then you have 26 dimensions for, for each of the 26 characters of the first letter, plus 26 more for the last name. So that's 52 elements, and you see that they're very sparse. So um, by definition, each training feature will only have two non-zero elements in its uh, in its in its training vector. The labels are a lot easier because there's only two categories in this training set, so it just assumes that names are binary, male, female. So the the binary labels from according to this data set are just one or zero. So uh, zero is male and one is female. And finally, we have numbers that we can pass into our classifier. So once we go there, uh, for the classifier, I'm going to use a naive base classifier, which is actually one of the most simple uh, machine learning classification models that there are. Um, it uses Bayes' rule essentially to figure out, the, to estimate the probability that something is part of a category given the data. Um, so all I'm really doing is I'm splitting the data here into training and test sets, just so I have an independent set. So I'm taking the first 5,000 elements for training and the remaining ones for test. Uh, and then I'm, yeah, I'm importing the categorical naive base. And in two lines, I define a model, I fit the model, and sklearn does this for me. And then I can predict both on the training and on the test data. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just scroll through this because this is just the post-processing, like calculating the accuracy or plotting the matrices. But you'll see that what the results are when I do this. Uh, my training accuracy seems to have come out to about 
3,900 out of 5,000, so about 78%, and the test accuracy is 77%. It's better than random, because random would be 50% accuracy, but it's not great. Um, and that has to do with maybe the features that we picked or the naive base classifier. They're not, they have limited power, but this is our start, right? You can see that uh, about two thirds of the male names are categorized correctly and about, um, what is this? 83% anyway, of the female names were classified correctly. And this is interesting because remember that there are more female names than male names, which is why the model tends to skew to be more accurate to the female names. So here are some examples, right? You can see that most of these example predictions were predicted correctly. I think the one it got wrong in, in this example is Vern. I guess it it says that the actual name is the actual uh, is male, but it predicted Vern as female. And you can kind of see that it's not it, it it's not a oops. I guess I didn't run those all those sections. Hold on. Um, let me just rerun that again. If I if I run a different random set of examples, you see maybe here's another one that it that it got wrong. Jennifer is, a, is actually a female name, but it predicted it as a male name because if you, if you think about it, for in the English language at least, typically if it starts, if a name starts with a G and ends with an R, like R is not a traditional, like, you know, female ending letter. So, so these are kind of maybe ways that you can uh, rationalize why the model failed at those predictions. So I'll show you another example um, that does this a little bit better with, with some, more, some more advanced techniques, right? This is another one where we're going to load this uh, 20 news groups data set. So this is basically a data set that you can also download from, I think, from SK Learn, which just has a bunch of text that come from, uh, from various topics of, of like online news groups. Uh, the way that this works is I'm going to load this 20 news groups data set and I'm going to pick a subset of categories here. So you see that I'm picking categories like automotive, like autos, cars, motorcycles, baseball, hockey, cryptography, electronics, medical science, and space. And I'm going to try train a classifier that can correctly classify these. Um, instead of using one hot encoding, this time around I'm going to use bag of words features. Uh, SK Learn has uh, bag of words functionality uh, in the count vectorizer. And you can see that it can use bag of words either on the individual words or on n-grams. So I have this option here of passing in an n-gram range. If I tell it 1, 1, it means that it's only going to use 1 grams or individual words. But if I said, for instance, 1 to 2, then it would use words plus uh, bigrams. So you can play that around with that for yourself. The idea is that I'm going to create this count vectorizer and then try it on a bunch of sentences. So here we have a bigger data set. You see that our training data has, uh, has 4762 elements and a lot of features. So this is how many different uh, words are in your vocabulary. There's 50,000 words. Um, and you see in the example sentences that I've created here that I want to try classify, when I put them through the, one, the, the um, bag of words, then it, it can tell me of those 50, 55,000 features, which of my indices are non-zero and what are their counts. Take, for example, um, the third sentence here, which has a number two. This has to do with the word the, because there are two instances of the, right? Resistors dissipate heat proportional to the square of the current through them. So now we have these bag of words vectors, which remember, they're a lot bigger, but these are just the non-zero elements of the vector. And now we can use these directly for classification. In this case, I'm, I'm still going to use sklearn, but I'm going to use a, a, a bit better of a classifier. In this case, I'm using a support vector machine. And I'm putting, I'm putting the, the um, one hot encoding and the support vector machine into the, what is known as a pipeline in sklearn. So you see, I'm creating a pipeline where I'm first doing the, the bag of words count vector, then passing it through the classifier, and I can train this whole pipeline in one shot. Um, the classifier being, of course, this guy right here, which is the uh, support vector machine classifier and its parameters. 
So once I create the pipeline, really the, the money line here is here, model.fit on our training data and our labels. And then the rest is just doing the predictions. And so the same kind of post processing we've done before. Um, here now you can see that the test, the training accuracy is almost 100%. The test accuracy is 88.2%. So it's, it seems to be overfitting a little bit, but at least for our sample data, it has correctly predicted things, right? Like the Hubble Space Telescope is very much about space. Audis are cars. Barry Bonds is a baseball player. And COVID-19 and global pandemics have to do with, of course, medical science. So you can see that, that our accuracy is pretty good in that confusion matrix. Um, most of the things are correctly classified. Uh, it seems to, if you look at kind of what gets commonly confused, it might be baseball and hockey seem to get commonly confused, as well as electronics and medicine for some reason. I guess there's a lot of overlap there. But that, that's, that's good. Um, in the next, the next section is actually the same exact code, except for one extra thing in which I'm extracting features uh, in between the bag of words and the SVM. I'm also reweighting those bag of words features using TF IDF, which we've seen before. Again, the SK Learn just has that built in. So now my pipeline consists of the count vector, the TF IDF transformer, and the classifier, where I'm just creating this directly using SK Learn, it'll do all the counting and reweighting for you. And the idea is that if you run this, um, you see that here, for example, the IDF weights for all the words, it's a big vector, but they all got weighted. And just by adding TF IDF, my training accuracy still remains close to 100%, but my test accuracy has increased a lot more, up to about 93, 94%. Um, yeah. Let me actually just run them all again. Um, just, I want to show you just how quickly this runs. Uh, and, well, not, not quickly in the sense that it's running quickly right now, but how quickly, it, how slower it can get if I add more stuff to it. So, so again, this is my confusion matrix. What I can do is if in, the, in my count vectorizer, if I decide instead of using just words or one grams, I'm going to go between one grams and three grams. So now my vocabulary is going to be uh, is going to be not just the words, but the sequences of words of two and three words. And I'm actually also going to print the shape. Uh, actually, this might be this might be the length of the vector. So by adding more n grams to my system. In maybe I have more predictive power, maybe, um, but it's going to be a lot slower because now my, my feature vector is going to increase by counting not just the words, but the sequences of two words, the sequences of three words, all as different unique features. What you can see here is my IDF weights by using one to three grams is, what is this? This is 1.3 million is my, is my vocabulary size using n-grams, and it doesn't really give me a lot more training it doesn't really give me more accuracy at all. So it seems like n-grams are not really needed for this problem. Whereas if I go back to just using individual words without n-grams, it's a lot quicker and my IDF weights as expected are 55,000, which was that number of words in my vocabulary. So the whole point is that n-grams can get really inefficient, especially as you add uh, a combination of different numbers of n-grams. So that's all I'm going to share about um, statistical uh, machine learning. I think I, I want to maybe take uh, one or two more questions before moving on to the last section. OK, so let me read out some of the question. OK, so the first one is, uh, which book is good for statistical or statistics use in NLP. I'm not too sure. I guess this is for statistical NLP, I guess. Yeah. Books maybe is the one that you're using. Yeah. Um, I am, I didn't particularly use a book for statistical NLP. So certainly there are lots of books that just talk about the, the model part of this, right? Just forget what the features are. Um, the model itself, I think that's where you can benefit from books like, uh, you know, the classic artificial intelligence and model approach by uh, 
what is it, Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig. Um, that's a great book. For the NLP part itself, um, actually, I, I do have a lot of features or a lot of links scattered throughout um, some of this code and some of these slides. But NLTK, the, the package, they have their own manual book where they have a whole chapter on classification. And also SK Learn, the, the package has a lot of cool examples on NLP applications. I would go there. Um, also, there are a lot of, uh, uh, Stanford University is one of the, the, the most, uh, it's one of the best uh, schools for NLP. And they have a lot of YouTube lectures posted up. I think it's, uh, yeah, so I would look for the Stanford Intro to NLP um, uh, course recordings, which are all available on YouTube. Very helpful. All right. Okay. So the next question is: Is did RL uh, RL models are good for NLP? Um, it can be. Um, can, can, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go on. Just, yeah. Can you explain about the transformer sequence to sequence model architecture in simple? Okay, so, so for both of those questions, I'm gonna say yes. Uh, I actually have, at the end of this presentation, I have a slide on transformers and a slide on a deep RL example. So I will just say, please wait. <laughs> okay, right. And then for the, from the same person, it's uh, SGD plus Gaia is uh, statistical gradient descent, I guess. And maybe uh, you mistake yes. by saying SVM. Uh, no, no, no. The, Actually, let me let me create a new tab here. Um, SK Learn SGD classifier. I, I thought about the same thing, so thank you for asking that question. Uh, if you look at the the SK Learn thing, so SGD classifier here is actually linear classifiers that can that can take a lot of different uh, types like SVM logistic regression, but they do use SGD as the um, as the optimization algorithm, that's correct. The way it works is that when you create this SGD classifier, um, at some point, I forget where, hold on. There is a way to, yeah, here it is, so, sorry, it's the first parameter. When you say loss, um, depending on the loss function that you give, uh, you get a different classification algorithm. So the default hinge will give you a linear support vector machine. But if you do things like uh, like log loss or perceptron and so on, you actually do get different models like linear regression and logistic regression. So yeah, thank you. That's good to clarify. Okay, so, so far, these are the questions. Okay, that's good. So I'll move on to the last part, um, which is kind of already also fed by the questions, right? Deep learning happened, and all of these techniques that I shared have uh, in some way gone out the door. I mean, they're still used, but particularly n-grams, which used to be like the state of the art. There are lots of clever techniques for working with n-grams. Um, they have been completely dethroned by, by neural networks. So I wanna give that its fair uh, presentation time. So why did deep learning uh, help with NLP? Well, all these traditional approaches that we just talked about have a lot of issues. Number one, and by far the, the, the hardest one, that hand-engineered features are, have a lot of problems and they're very inefficient. Um, first of all, coming up with the features by hand, like the first and last character you saw was not great and it, it puts a lot of work on the engineer. And the whole point of machine learning is that you don't know about your data, otherwise you would just create rules. So then we go into things like one-hot encoding or n-grams or bag of words in that based on how big your vocabulary is, you need one extra dimension for every single separate word. And you saw these vector sizes can get massive. I mean, you know, can you, what can you do with a big data set if your feature vector size is 50,000? Um, that can get really, really challenging. Also the feature vectors are sparse both the, the bag of words and one hot encodings, whether you're using words or engrams, they only, like any typical sentence will only have a couple of elements that are not zero. So it's pretty hard for a model to learn from, from this stuff. And, and what I think is one of the key things is that every word in your vocabulary is treated independently. So for example, if I had the sentence, the big dog and the large hound, 
then just by treating these as completely separate words in my vocabulary, the, the model doesn't really know that these two sentences have any equivalence associated with them. Also, just completely forgetting the features that all these statistical models like support vector machines, um, they have a limited capacity for how much they can learn. Whereas neural networks are really great at overfitting to complicated uh, uh, data. So just in general, like using neural networks is, uh, it can be more powerful even with the same features. Um, and finally, that the when you when you start dealing with long or variable size sequences, uh, it can get pretty challenging. So n-grams are very impractical beyond four or five. In fact, most people just use uh, two or three for n-grams, if, if at all. And many of the traditional models that we just saw, like the naive base classifier, support vector machine, linear regression, they traditionally accept fixed size data, but sentences or text or speech, they don't have a fixed number of words. So you either have to be clever about, you know, padding or buffering things um, to make things work. And neural networks can address a lot of these things. So let's get to that. First of all, um, I've been complaining a lot about the features <laughs> from natural language, right? So one cool thing you can do um, that has been done with neural networks is to learn these lower dimensional word embeddings from large data sets. So, and this is an unsupervised learning method. The idea is, um, if I just can go through, the idea is that you can use machine learning to convert, you know, these giant vocabularies of, you know, 50 to 100,000 words into a lower dimensional vector that actually encodes some of the similarities between words. For example, this is a picture from the from one type of pre-trained word embedding called glove, um, where you see here that for these pairs of words like man and woman, sir and madam, uh, king and queen, they all kind of keep the same spatial relationship between each other in that vector space, which means that you can basically like if you if your training data talks about um, you know like brothers and, and men and then you test on something that with sister and women, then it can still kind of keep that relationship without even having seen it in your training data. So, so the, the, the idea is that you would, this is a kind of a typical neural network where you would start with an input and you see on the left here, this is a one hot encoded input. You would pass it through some kind of embedding that would reduce it to a lower dimensional vector. This is typically in like the hundreds range. And then once you have these lower dimensional word embeddings that are not just zeros and ones, they're a lot more dense, um, you can then use those embeddings as the input to your uh, machine learning model. There are embeddings that operate only on words, like uh, word to vec glove, fast text. And the cool thing is that all of these have pre-trained models you can just download from the web, um, as well as embeddings that actually deal with the, the, like the context or where the sentence is in an entire where the word is in an entire sentence, like Infersent from Facebook or Elmo from Allen NLP. So I wanna illustrate word embeddings a little better by going through one of the examples. So here I'm gonna go through um, the glove word embeddings and these are actually, you can directly download them from the Stanford webpage. So, like I said, Stanford is really a powerhouse in natural language processing. Um, okay, seems the page isn't loading for me yet. Okay, well, we'll, we'll let that go for a second. Um, okay, so the idea here is that you can download these word vectors, which are basically these giant text files of pre-trained weights for a neural network. Uh, you can you can download them, and there's actually lots of different uh, different sizes of vectors that you can load. Why isn't this loading? Anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm downloading. I guess it's it's in the comments, but I'm going to download this, their smallest quote unquote uh, download, which is about 800 megabytes, and these contain um, these contain vectors glove 6b. So it's it's basically trained on uh, on, on six billion different tokens, and they trained models of different sizes. So they have a, a 50 dimensional, 100 dimensional, 200 and 300 dimensional. 
the idea is that uh, as you go down in dimension, it's you know less memory, more efficient, but maybe you lo lose data. So I'm going to be right in the middle there, where I'm going to use the embeddings that will take my vocabulary to a lower hundred-dimensional vector. So we'll see what that looks like. Um, you know, once I load this and create all my weights, uh, you can see that there are a total of four thousand words in the dictionary, meaning that these embeddings will make it easier for me to train a model by going from a big vocabulary of 400,000 words to a lower dimension of 100. And here I've shown an example of, this is the vector embedding for dog. You see it's a 100 element vector and it's not just zeros and ones, it's a dense vector. So now with this 100 element vector, we can, we can use it for machine learning or, or we can actually have some fun, we can do some fun math on these vectors. Because uh, what's cool about word embeddings is that um, you can actually, because these embeddings are trained that similar words are grouped together, you can do some like vector mathematics on them. And that's what you can do here. So I've just created a function that basically finds the closest embeddings. So it's going to just look at all these vectors and the things that have the lowest distance, so like Euclidean distance, are going to be the closest other words to uh, to, to that word. So here's some cool ones. You see, um, I'm going to create an embedding vector for the word king, and then I'm going to give you the three closest embeddings to king, which end up being prince, queen, and monarch. Because it knows that by reading the data, these are words that are typically close together. And then you can actually do math. You can like add things and remove things. So for example, if I say king plus woman, minus man, then you see now I get queen, monarch, and throne. And that makes sense because the, the, the top one is saying that, you know, if, if you had a king that was a woman instead of a man, then you would call her a queen. Um, but then the other alternative representation for these two is that if you just completely remove gender from the equation, then, you know, these gender neutral terms like monarch and throne also end up coming up in the embedding space. Another fun one is if you take south and you remove down and add up, then the closest word ends up being north, which makes sense because south is to down as north is to uh, up. So again, this has implications for uh, machine learning because now you actually have word similarities encoded in a vector, which is awesome. Uh, th there's this common, because these vectors are 100 dimensional, so you still can't really visualize them, right? There's a, a, a common technique called t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, or t-SNE, which is just part of scikit-learn or many other packages, where we can actually visualize these vectors in a two-dimensional projection that represents how close these vectors are. So I'm actually taking the top 2,000 words and putting them through one of these t-SNE plots, and you get this word cloud that you can't see what's happening here. However, we can zoom. So take, for example, I'm gonna zoom into one of these sections. Look at this. The words that are bundled together are like high, low, lower and higher, highest levels. So these have to do with, with you know, high and low. Um, and then as you, start, as you start going through, you get things like rates, inflation, rising, rise. These now have to start maybe start doing with money or, or maybe not, but because you're talking about lower and higher, you often talk about lower rates, lower inflation, uh, rising rates of inflation. And unsurprisingly, if I keep scrolling through, I start getting things like price, value, quarter, earning, profit. So, so the words are kind of moving along a spectrum of how they're related. Like what is related to sales, consumer, economy, global, worldwide, finance, business, so on. So I, I encourage you to download this code and play with it yourself because it's super cool seeing how the patterns uh, shape in here. So we have word embeddings and the idea is that now we can put them through a neural network. There are lots of types of neural networks and all of these can accept embeddings, but just to give you a quick recap, because I don't want to spend too much time on, on the neural networks. So your traditional neural network is what's known as a fully connected network or a multi-layer perceptron. 
So you can directly pass these embeddings through one of these um, and do some kind of classification or regression or prediction task. But there are other types of neural networks, which maybe you've seen before, that take advantage of the space and time relation of data, which is absolutely common in text. So you've got, of course, convolutional neural networks, which are traditionally used for things like images or audio, in which you basically create these filters that sweep through an image and then feed into a fully connected network, typically. Um, you can definitely use that on text sequences. Um, the one that's more commonly used is the recurrent neural network, in which you basically have these blocks of neural networks that are, you can basically like, uh, like copy paste them and chain them in any order. So they're really good at processing like sequences of text. But you might also have some combination of things that use both recurrent and spatial elements like graph neural networks, which are uh, some of the newest things that are coming out. But by far, uh, the recurrent neural network was what caused the revolution in NLP for a long time. Um, so much so that I'm going to talk about those a little bit more. So recurrent neural networks are great in that they can handle uh, variable length sequences of data because you can chain these recurrent units to any length. So the idea is that you would encode your language using something like a one-hot encoding or a word embedding. You would pass it through a recurrent neural network that goes through the sequence of text so that you can have information about the order of your words. And then depending on what you're doing, uh, you can also decode. Uh, for example, the two of the common architectures for recurrent neural networks, one of them is what I'm going to call a classification type. So this is a recurrent neural network where you basically encode an entire sequence through a recurrent neural network. And then at the end, you maybe just pick out like the last element and put it through a, a fully connected network. Compare that with something that is also very commonly done. Uh, and I think someone asked about this, this seek to seek or sequence to sequence uh, with machine learning in which you're encoding something a sequence and then you're decoding it to create another sequence. Uh, common things, uh, common applications of sequence to sequence include things like translation or generating captions, answering questions, and so forth. Um, and, and yeah, people were doing this with recurrent neural networks for quite a while. Now, there's been a lot of advances in recurrent neural networks that are now basically seen as standard. Uh, and I'm going to talk about three things. One is this notion of long short-term memory units. So basically the traditional, I'm not going to go into much detail about these, but just for your knowledge so you can look at more. Um, the traditional recurrent neural networks had a problem where if you had these long sequences and you chain together a bunch of, um, a bunch of recurrent elements, then it was really hard to train because of this issue of vanishing or exploding gradients. So, so there have been these tricks that basically try to like contain or normalize uh, each recurrent unit so that this is less of a problem. And the techniques here are generally called long short-term memory units, LSTM, although there are other variations like uh, GRUs or gated recurrent units. Uh, another thing that helps is, so RNNs, recurrent neural networks, they don't have to be one directional. So you don't have to go through the sequence from right to from left to right. If you have the whole sequence in front of you, you can also do a second pass or a com basically a completely separate network that goes through in the backwards direction. And then you can concatenate these together. And this just gives you more information at the expense of more memory. So it, they, it can cause improvement in your results. Another important one is this notion of attention, which we'll get to uh, also a little bit later, in which instead of just encoding something in a recurrent neural network and taking the last thing uh, for decoding and classification, you can also, in parallel, teach what is known as an attention vector. So this is taking, like learning some kind of linear weighting of each of the elements in your encoded sequence and basically creating this kind of like context aware vector that you can use to, to help improve your accuracy. And it's been shown that attention is, uh, has, been, has been crucial at getting, uh, getting recurrent neural networks to behave better, not just because it's more parameters you can learn so you get more power, but also because they can basically cause you to like, like directly bypass certain connections so it's, it's just a lot easier to train these kind of networks. So certainly when you're dealing with RNNs, absolutely look at these three techniques and I would encourage you to look at them in more detail. 
Um, I have one code example in this as well. RNA classification. This is actually based on my research work, so the code is a little bit complicated. So I'm going to go through it in, in, in not so much detail, but, but I'm going to go back to the same one of the same examples that we've seen before, where we're, we have these commands like find a red apple near the kitchen, and I want to create a network that will actually output what the action is, what the room is, and what the object is. But now, because we're using, um, because we're going to be using recurrent neural networks and and uh, word embeddings. I don't need to build up a bank of synonyms. I'm going to assume that the word embeddings just handle that for me, which is really nice. So basically what I'm going to do, I'm just going to uh, keep going through here. Um, it's going to load the word embeddings, which should take a little while, but then you'll see what my data set looks like. Uh, and, and here I'm using pandas to represent it as a table. So I might have a sentence like this, I clean up the apple from the living room and my labels are the action is store, the room is living room, and the object is fruit. So this is going to be like a multi-class classification problem where I've used um, a thousand elements of the training set. So I'll do, I'll do that. Um, so for example, one of my sentences like get me some banana by the bedroom gets encoded using one hot encoding to this tensor. So get some banana by the bedroom, and then my indices are also encoded by the by the classify, classification label. This one hot encoding vector, then we're going to put it through word embeddings and a neural network, and we'll see how that works. So here I'm defining a, an architecture, and this is kind of where, where I'm doing the the um, the bulk of the network definition, where I have first of all my embedding layer. Here, you see I'm creating a, a, a word embedding layer from the pre-trained glove weights. And I'm setting them, let me zoom out a little bit. I'm setting them to be frozen, meaning that I'm, I'm not going to let the network train them. I'm just going to assume that these are fixed weights. Once you're there, you can create, you can just use, uh, sorry, I'm using PyTorch, by the way, for my uh, neural networks. I'm going to create a, uh, depending on the input that I pass in, I'll create the recurrent layers, either using just the plain vanilla recurrent neural networks or using the GRU, gated recurrent unit, or the LSTM. And then once I've encoded this, date, this uh, embedded data into my recurrent layer, I have three separate linear layers for classifying the action, the room, and the object. Again, I won't go through that in too much detail, but Here's again a summary of our network. Um, this is the network before we even trained it. So you see you have the embedding layer, the recurrent layer, and then the three uh, linear layers for classification. So if I have this sentence, it gets encoded to a sequence, and then I get the probabilities that they belong to different actions, rooms, or objects, which you see they're very close to random because I haven't yet trained my network. So the idea is that I can then define my optimizer on classification loss. And I'm just going to let this go for, for a little bit. Um, it actually, it might take a while. Uh, but essentially, I'm, you know, I'm creating this network. I'm using an LSTM with 32 hidden dimensions and two layers, uh, running it through you know, a certain number of passes through my data, using a, the, the um, log likelihood classification loss, atom optimizer, and then eventually, once I get, I guess, to the fifth epoch, I'm going to get my, um, my results. So that might, I guess it's taking a lot longer because uh, Zoom seems to be hogging my GPU. <laughs> but yeah. So we'll let this run. Um, while this is training, is there, is there maybe a question that I can answer? No question in the chat. Windows actually. Okay. okay. So we'll let this go. Um, again, I encourage you to download this code because I've created, I've given you a script that will actually generate training data randomly, which is pretty nice for testing this out. And also, uh, the neural network that I define has a lot of options, as you can see. So you, if you, you can see what you can do if you try change, like maybe try make it not bidirectional or change the unit type to just plain RNN, change the layer size, the hidden layer sizes, and so on. 
and just see how your performance changes. But here's what I get in my training loss, right? Um, I, obviously this is good, my uh, loss decreases, but it doesn't mean anything unless I evaluate against the training set. So what I'm gonna do here is just, here's just a function that will predict the network and give me the outputs. But the whole point is that now uh, with this network, I get a training accuracy of 97% and a test accuracy of about the same, means that it, we didn't really overfit. Um, and you can see things like the command drive near the beverage. It predicts that you see most of these scores are pretty close to one. Um, it's saying that my action is go, uh, my location is unknown because I didn't specify a room and drink uh, ties into beverage in the same way, you know, crackers ties into snack, uh, sitting room means living room and, and so on. So, so here's kind of how you can see that the word embeddings, the fact that someone already pre-trained on a bunch of data really helped you to deal with the synonyms without, uh, without us having to, to do that. So that gets to my last slide on neural networks, which was also part of the question someone asked. What about transformer networks? Yes, transformer networks are a thing. Um, there was a paper by uh, Google Brain in 2017 called Attention is All You Need. And they made a claim that this attention thing that people were adding to neural networks was so powerful that they came up with a, a set of neural network architectures that doesn't even use recurrent elements. It only uses attention to basically learn like a set of linear weights um, on entire sequences at the same time. Um, and this is what's led to these networks called transformers. They're very powerful. Um, unlike recurrent neural networks, they don't by default have any, any information about this, the like order of words. So they, they basically hacked around this by adding this, this positional encoding thing, but that seems to work pretty well. So, Basically, they, yeah, they've created these architectures where they train what, is known as, what are known as multi-head attention layers, where you basically have like a bunch of different attention mechanisms in parallel that might learn different things about your data. And then you just chain a bunch of these um, as encoders or decoders, and they've shown to be really powerful in sequence-to-sequence -sequence, um, tasks. So yeah, these transformers are absolutely dominating all of natural language processing today. Um, they're very powerful, but they are huge. They have a lot of weights. Um, in fact, like when I was putting together an example, um, only really the smallest ones would fit into my GPU memory of uh, three gigabytes. So there are some trade-offs there, but, but yeah, they, I think if, if anyone is, uh, is working on NLP, I would encourage you to look at transformers. And what's cool is that there is a library called, uh, what's that? there's a library called Hugging Face Transformers, which has taken all of these common transformers and pre-trained models and created a really nice uh, high level library that works with both PyTorch and the new version of TensorFlow. So I would absolutely encourage, if you're working on transformers, look at this. You can basically load a transformer and then get a trainable network uh, with some of these common models like BERT or GPT-2. Um, so that's what I did. I basically installed the transformers library and I can't run this while Zoom is going, but I'll show you really quickly how this works. Um, when you get a transformer, you can basically import some of these pre-trained models. Like here I'm using one of the base uh, BERT models. Um, and what I can do is, for example, I can take a sample sentence, like this machine learning is a study of algorithms, and I can encode it through the pre-trained network. So you see here, I get my basically my vector of uh, hidden states and attentions that I can then use either to feed downstream into other models or, um, or to retrain them on different problems. So, so the, the idea is the same, like transformers will first encode text using some kind of embedding. And then instead of using recurrent neural networks, they'll use this whole like multi-head attention framework to, uh, to do the equivalent processing. And these are trainable models. What's nice about this hugging face library is that they provide these pipelines for common tasks like sentiment analysis, question answering. So I actually found something really cool, which is a pre-trained model 
uh, pre-trained version of BERT that is uh, tweaked using this uh, benchmark called the Stanford Question Answering Dataset, or SQUAD. I took this pre-trained model and I put it against um, I put it against the first paragraph or the first set of paragraphs of the RoboCup Wikipedia page, which reads as follows. And then I asked the following questions. When was RoboCup founded? Who is the president of RoboCup? Where was the 2019 competition held? And what is its main goal? By creating this question answering pipeline, I was actually able to go through my questions and get the correct answers, which I thought was really impressive with just a pre-trained model that knows how to extract answers from a body of text. Um, see, pretty confident that RoboCup was founded in 1996. President is uh, Professor Peter Stone. And uh, last year it was held in Sydney. And one of the main goals of RoboCup, this one is less certain, but it's to promote robotics and AI research through competition. So absolutely check out this Hugging Face Transformers library if you want to know more. Um, I'm going to just quickly do a, a couple of wrap-up slides, and then uh, we'll leave the next maybe five minutes for questions. So in general, natural language processing is more than text, especially with robotics, because robots have a lot of sensors, like cameras or, or microphones. So it really makes sense that machine learning research is moving towards this multimodal NLP, which you can kind of see that it mimics how humans have multiple sentences or senses. Um, for instance, you can see examples that combine both audio and text features on the left, or that combine vision and text on the right. It's the same thing where like you have different ways to encode text data or vision data or audio data, and then once your features are numbers, you can put them through any kind of classifier like a neural network. Um, I've, I actually want to show a case study from some of the work that I'm doing because it combines rule-based and uh, and, and machine learning for NLP. So say I have this sentence from my home service robot. Go to the living room, find a red soda near the banana on the table, then put it away. I first use a combination of rule-based and, and learn models to do this, the, the parse tree using NLTK like we saw before. So I'm taking the sentence and splitting it into three different verb phrases. For each of those, I then have a recurrent neural network, uh, LSTM network, that will resolve these sentences into individual commands, like go to the living room, find a soda, put a soda away. But there are some, some sentences that are really complicated. Like when I say a red soda near the banana on the table, I'm actually gonna combine this with a network that also uses vision to try correctly identify which of my detected soda uh, cans is the correct one. In this case, it's the red one near the banana and so on. So there's a lot of things you can learn in addition. So I have a rule-based system that does co-reference resolution. So like when I say put it away, what does it mean? And also if I tell it to look for a red soda, but there is no red soda, how do you do that? What if there is no red soda? So I'm also using machine learning to, to classify on these uh, absence of objects. I think this is best expressed with a video. So this is uh, the Toyota HSR in simulation where I've asked it to pick up an apple to the right of a red coffee mug. Uh, this is my whole integrated system. So basically this language is being grounded to an executable plan. This is a behavior tree that's gonna go through the different locations on the floor and, uh, and basically you know, look down at some of the common known areas in the kitchen and see if it can find the right thing. So here you can see on the top left that there I asked for an apple to the right of a red coffee mug. There is an apple, but it's not next to a mug, so it, it treats it as an unknown thing. It's not here. What I'm looking for is not here. So then I'm just going to fast forward, and I'm going to look here at the next viewpoint, in which you now have two apples. One is to the left, and one is to the right of the mug. And you can see that the grounding system is able then to extract correctly that I'm, I actually want the apple that's to the right of the mug instead of the left one. And then it will go through and pick up the object and go about its merry way. Okay. Um, someone asked about deep reinforcement learning. So I put another case study here from Microsoft Research, which does exactly that. They introduced this thing called vision language navigation, where they rendered these photorealistic environments um, to basically follow instructions, like 
in the text instructions, like, you know, take a ride on the staircase and go up. And the way they do that is they have a self-supervised mechanism in which some robotic agent will follow the instructions, compare it to maybe a more random trajectory that you see on the right. And then using, using this um, uh, kind of how efficient or and how, suc how successful the task was, it's uh, basically self-training self -training itself using reinforcement learning to come up with ways to execute these long plans that you see there in the video. Um, these like long sequences of text that tell you how to navigate a household environment. So I would absolutely look at that. A lot of information, so I just want to give a really quick wrap up. Um, the things that we saw are what is NLP. So it's, it's the branch of AI dealing with human machine interaction in human language. There are lots of applications that we saw through the different examples. Of course, there's way more. Um, there are rule based versus statistical methods. Uh, yeah, and even though deep learning has dominated in the last few years, there are still applications for rule based uh, systems, especially if you combine them with learned approaches and that NLP can be multimodal so it's not you shouldn't ever just constrain it to text there are lots of different sensing modalities that are really key for robotics you want to take advantage of all those sensors um, so here's like a, a smattering of popular NLP tools uh, we've covered some of these like NLTK, scikit-learn, PyTorch and Hugging Face Transformers library I will be sharing these slides too, so take a look at this. I did leave a couple of resources at the bottom here too on the audio stuff, which I did not cover. So things like speech recognition, text-to-speech, and machine learning using audio data. So definitely take a look at that. Um, yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, you can go to my website or my GitHub to learn more, um, specifically for uh, this presentation, I have shared the code and the PDF slides at this repository. So absolutely check this out and reach out if you have any questions. So thank you. I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, right. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. So let me turn on my video as well. And um, okay, so quick. Right, no question. Right, so far, yeah, appreciate uh, your presentation uh, from the question. So maybe let me like type up this. Okay, okay. So make sure that you you record down, but don't worry. Like, as we have the video, that we, so um, you can check uh the blog. Right, and for the for the rest, like if let's say you need any more uh, class, so you can yeah, these are all some links and our github and so on and for more information right so just let me go through um i would like to like spend more time on discussion just some um, one very quick slide that starting from next um next week so we will start this online tutorial through um some of the contents previously um in march if i'm not mistaken so we spent about six weeks uh to introduce how you want to develop speech, how you want to develop um, vision systems and so on. So um, a very nice um, initiative by our Indies uh, so that for any of you that would like to know more about how to build robots, so yeah, please sign up for this um, free, uh, how to develop your own. Okay, and, and there's um, no hardware requirement. So even though you don't have any robots, you can still join this, spread this information for your community. Okay, right. So let's come back to Sebastian for the very wonderful um, presentation. And I would like to say that I, I feel that they are particularly on the few last slides that I'm very much interested on how you actually implement those things on, on, on the robots and how you combine with the vision, particularly application that for, for this um, NLP and also the real application that we can use. But maybe for the general public that not using robots, I think like a lot like, for example, you can use your phone with a camera, the speaker, then you can do a lot of application as well. So I think we can actually do a lot and uh, like if you can actually review more of your research with us later on. Okay, right. But um, so let's see if uh, we have any question from the chat. Do you have any recommendation of books about statistical NLP? Oh yeah. And, yeah, so and I, also, I think yeah. we talked about that one yeah. a little bit, right? So, so remember that the features that you extract, like once you extract features from the type of machine learning model, so I would recommend just the introduction part. Um, like I said, for I, I, NLP, I'm sure there are some, but like I said, uh, maybe you saw them, I mentioned them a lot. So, uh, and they even recorded their NLP. They have a lot of really great insights, um, as well as the manual, a lot of really hands-on examples, a lot of which I borrowed from. <laughs> yeah. Well, as the time has passed, to 
uh, we're supposed to end by now, but um, I, I think like we would like to discuss more. So for those of you that leave, please make sure that uh, you take down the participant feedback form and also I, I would like to um, ask you to actually write that in the comment form so that we can we can request we can and, and please um, send us some feedback. Uh, so after this, uh, we can continue to discuss with Sebastian. I think about 10 to 20 minutes for discussion. So um, since we are already over the, the normal leaves, right, you are like, free to go, but we will continue. So we can spend about Sebastian on, on any question that you would like to ask. So would like to speak. Yeah, you are free to turn on your Absolutely. audio if you like. If no question, then maybe from me. <laughs> right. I'd like to ask like, so um, just now from the last few things into real application. So I would like to know like how to cover in detail today from the statistical or from the rule-based um, development, the NLP application that you just showed us. So how much in between, in between that, that you think you can actually um, share, you can share with us now that what will be the workflow or the process before you actually create a model application in robots? Yeah, oh man, there was so many things that came together. Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest thing I'll reiterate is that I did use a copy really, really hard to learn everything mm -hmm. from scratch, a raw set of text, and a lot of, a lot of data. Okay. So I think to get a system working practically, A, you can bring in rule-based systems to help you know, reduce some of that space. Mm -hmm. Two, the use of pre-trained models that are available for download are absolute speech tagging for sentences, mm -hmm. pre-trained models for the word mm -hmm. embeddings, I'm using those glove word embedding, using pre-trained uh, like ResNet networks that are trained on the image. So there's a lot of pre-trained things that, that, that are we're leveraging that you should absolutely start with, I don't know, start with a simple problem and then start adding complexity, right? Um, simulation work. So I actually spent a lot of time spawn objects in simulation. It would, you know, robot and it would automatically collect images. And because you know, it was automatically labeling also the bounding boxes. Um, so, so all of this life a lot easier for you because you don't have to label by hand, hand labeling data. All right. So a lot of that, uh, yeah. So I guess like actually, right, there's one question. There, there's uh, a lot more, yeah. yeah. So uh, what is the one thing not um, a bit not so related to NLP? But I guess, I guess before this, right? Um, well, it, it is, but, but it wasn't, it was in control oh, simulation. Yeah. Okay. So I think maybe what, what are just in general, like learning about like big systems and like how a lot of like, those types of systems, because it's not, you're not just doing one thing, like you really for the home service robots, yeah. right? Where, you know, like we have to do a computer vision task or all of a sudden we have so, so just picking up these new skills, getting it all to play together and doing some impressive into the technical part of robotics. Of course, there's also the, the, so that the fact that robots can and are used for productive rescue home service. Um, it makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. So for, for this particular question, so any question, any, so there's a feedback said that need the owl to rely on, rely on. Yeah. Right. So if no question, so I have another question in those things like, um, and, and also like you, you told us about like you actually assemble a lot of um, model in order of, about robotics development. So we, we don't really create any sub section is um, our, our expertise or our field of concern right. that is too multidisciplinary that we cannot build anything from scratch. So our work is basically, uh, I mean like NLP or deep learning development is really not possible between, but most of our work actually as a robotics development or engineers, we are actually less than uh, building a subsystem from scratch, I guess. That really gets to what my job is at, at C-Cell right now, right? I work yeah. in a research lab. Yeah. What researchers are doing is exactly that. Like they're, they're doing a very, want to put that on a real mm -hmm. robot. You know, let's, let's say they're doing research on NLP. If they want to do an experiment with a real robot, yes. they to pick up objects. Mm -hmm. And who's going to be doing that? Well, <laughs> software engineers. I am integrating things so that people can then start putting in their research into a system that is capable of not like one piece of code mm -hmm. without a, a fully- just, just curious that um, I'm not the distribution of the software engineer and also in over there, like the demand for, for how many of them are actually more focused on more basics research or, or focus on no, I mean, more high level I, research. I'm working so. for a research lab, so it's heavily skewed towards the research okay. portion. You're right. Um, it's a software engineering. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reason that, that, that this works, at least on my end, is that I, like I mentioned, you mentioned intro, that I work with the Toyota that has an interest in, in seeing this research come to life. So they actually are the ones that typically you will see software engineers at these at research labs in general. If the project is uh, that wants to move things along quicker, then you know, like letting, letting students learn how to code while doing the research. Yeah, I'm not sure. I like, just was curious. Do you require to write papers as well? If, yes. From if the... I'm involved in a paper, then I'll, I'll I might help write, post uh, okay, write okay. papers. But yeah. that is not your KPI, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So we have question. I have basic understanding of NLP, and I want to work on advanced model in NLP. What can be those models? Uh, you also mentioned a few things, but I could not get it. So, so what kind yeah, of model or, or anything so you can say? Today's world is just deep learning. So the, the, the advanced model works. Um, I am sharing the slides on the code. So I think uh, if you just look at 
once you scrub through, there are a lot of links there um, for resources. Okay, another question is about has there been any NLP tech who is conversed in a regional language and return back to him a translated version, real time translation question? So, something like an Alexa type, which can be handy as a language. Um, so, do you have any, I'm not sure, mandation of solutions that uh, they can do real time translation from different um, languages? You can actually speak into Google Translate on your phone and it will. It will translate it to, uh, when I've been in Asia for a Robo Cup recently. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had to communicate with certain people via my phone, and that has been very helpful uh, mm -hmm. because I don't speak the languages there. And that, I mean, like, take, take that the systems that you mentioned. They, like Amazon, for example, they sell their system in lots of languages where they, just like, like British English or the Indian accent of English. Um, they train in different languages. They, um, even though most of their data might be in English, they can still leverage some of the text in different languages so they can use smaller amounts of data. And that's what enables you know, you're doing Italian, which a lot less people in the world speak, but you still have very capable. By your comment, so there are actually a few things like, um, I'm not too sure approach in NLP. Is it apply for different kind of languages? Translation. I, I know that you can speak deep port to Spanish. Uh, define easily. So, so <laughs> I think the structure of the problem, problem very easy. Okay, all right. The, the big issue is, are there, are there parts of... When you talk about or grammar structure, or what kind of... Thing? Yes. All right. So particularly, yeah. For Chinese, yeah, for example, or Japanese, it's it would be very basically, It's basically in Spanish and there are okay. in English. So it's even easier. And that's maybe have trained models on Spanish. So you might think for bigger languages, like I, I mentioned some of the Stanford tools. I know for pipelines for English and Chinese, mm -hmm. and I think they, they probably have a lot of other major mm -hmm. languages. Yeah. But I, but I think... Like what you're saying is right. That the, the Chinese like alphabet structure is some like the characters, yeah. the words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And also, you use in order to build up the the real application is everything can be run on, or you need some cloud computing to train the models. But so far, the networks have been small enough where I can. Yeah, I can get a laptop with a decent GPU. Okay, so you, you just, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I know. Like you, you can run on board, but you PC, right? Okay, and, and that is enough. Okay, all right. So do you think something like NLP can be in, can in future be used to communicate with animals? Talking into text, um, okay. I, I don't know about animal language. Or oh, do they actually have the, language? The, the okay. difference yeah. is, which for the reason of making things easier for us, right? So we have a sound makes up words and those words are understood by other people. Like they, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but dogs. So the best thing we can do is to go directly from, uh, to mm. something in text. I think what, what, what might be easier to do first is like, you know, whether it's hungry or tired text. I mean, I don't know because they don't, dogs don't know our language to express those things. But yeah, from what you say, actually, like it triggered me to a very, you have shown is like you do the analysis, of the, mm -hmm. the analysis totally based on text. Yeah. Is that, is which, that right? So which of um, how to say meaning? Because like, for yes. example, we're human of how we say something. So maybe after you convert everything into a same person or a different person saying as the same sentence might um, right. the verbal and non-verbal address or this thing, or do they actually concern yeah, about that as well? involves audio. I think it's NLU, natural language. Under yeah, I mean, okay. think of the same thing where like, there's the common, the common saying that, <laughs> right? It's for that same reason. Uh, it's not just audio, right? Like if I'm saying something to be very different and <laughs> have different, yeah. so you could also, so I'm angry, you know? <laughs> so yeah. which means, this is, is this uh, actually be with audio? Is, is it that part? Okay, right. Like from one of the study, because I'm not sure whether it's true or not, because I don't forty percent is by verbal. Actually, sixty dealing with just the forty percent of like verbal. Three percent actually we try to convey some message to another person. If yeah, if you don't take right. account like the audio yeah. and also the body sets. Right. Robots can right. simplify yeah. very much like our servants, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, we usually interact for us. Mm -hmm. But what if we also want a robot to tell us if we're being meant to recreate? You know, like its feelings, like oh, I'm really happy. You yeah, to me today. which means like. Use. It is more communication, yeah. right? Longer just information providing, but it's a communication. So you need to add in the one. Well, I guess today is a uh, very happy before we close the session. I, I think like we have tried long enough. A lot of comments. So I just want to again say thank you for uh, the chance to invite me to this. Uh, it was fun brushing up on and I enjoyed some of this knowledge and you have the resources accessible. Thank you. Fran. Uh, right. Yeah. So thanks a lot, everyone. And um, we are going to close this session. And also thanks, Sebastian, for a very great um, presentation. So we, I hope like we can discuss, sure. actually share this from your present presentation. Just we would like to know from you. Right. So oh, thanks yeah. a lot. And yeah, so um, presentation today. So I would like to close this session. Right. Stop the recording, but please keep on the line. Thank you.